Hello, everyone. I am Ben Arona. Um, we're going to be discussing starting a restaurant business today. Um, we have about, I don't know, 10 or 11 slides we're going to go through. Um, and if anyone wants to ask any questions, please put it in the chat. Not a big deal. Um, I kind of prefer to answer questions if they come up uh, when we're in the moment. Um, if I'm going too fast, please uh, say you're going too fast. Um, I have a few uh, links we're going to be going over uh, and a few websites we're going to visit. Uh, so make sure to take those notes, okay? And um, uh, just follow with me. So um, with that, let's get started. So our lecture overview, what we're going to do today is we're going to meet your instructor. I'm going to give you a little bit about, a little bit about my background, explain who I am why I am even here talking to all of you. Uh, then we're gonna dive into the lecture itself. Uh, we're gonna discuss finding the right business model for your new, rest for your new restaurant. Um, kind of what might fit best for uh, what you wanna do, what your goals are, uh, maybe the process of, of how you make food, et cetera, et cetera. Then we're gonna jump into uh, how to attain a proper licensing from local governments. This is what really uh, kind of holds up a lot of people. This is kind of that albatross around a lot of people's necks. It scares them, but it's really simple, it's really basic. So um, pay attention to that. Um, and if you follow the steps, I think when I started my first restaurant, I did all this in two weeks. So all of you guys can definitely, if you're a go-getter, get it done real quick. We're going to jump into uh, how to study and obtain a manager's food handler certificate. Um, this is the one that really slows people down. Um, it seems like it's such a huge deal. I guess for me, I've been in the restaurant business since I was 14. Uh, so a lot of this stuff just kind of I learned along the way. I'm 43 now, so do the math on that one. Um, but there was still a, a curve that I had to uh, learn. Uh, so we'll go over that um, so you can get all up to date on that one. Then we're going to look into what type of kitchen space is appropriate for your new restaurant business. We'll look at the cottage scenario, cottage license scenario. We'll look at a commercial kitchen scenario, scenario. But then we'll look at like a brick and mortar and a food truck and pop up. Okay. Uh, we'll look at the basics of ordering food and obtaining vendors. We're kind of going to move through that one pretty quick. It's pretty basic, pretty easy. Um, basic of advertising and promotion. Uh, when I first started uh, Benny's Pizza out of my commercial kitchen I opened, um, I relied heavily on social media. So social media is a great tool. Um, it was no cost or and or little cost, and it worked out great. So I always share my experience with you when you get there, and uh, you could be just as successful as I was um, if you follow the basic rules. Uh, we'll jump into the basic economies of running a restaurant. That, that slide could be its own two-hour lecture within its own, uh, but we will probably spend 10 to 15 minutes on that and discuss um, rent, reoccurring costs like labor, uh, uh, utilities, uh, uh, fixing machines that break, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, we ended out with a link that is the Slow County Health Department documents. I, uh, we're going to kind of see that throughout the, the slides, but it's just kind of a place for you to look at the very end. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so there I am right there. That's me, Benny. Um, this is my current business. Uh, I, I own two restaurants in town. I own a commercial kitchen that I started um, two weeks before the pandemic. That was fun. Um, in San Francisco, I opened a commercial kitchen. Uh, I then started selling pizza out of it, out of a necessity. Um, I then uh, bought the brick and mortar location of uh, the old Technic Elgados in San Luis Obispo up on Monterey Street. Got that along with liquor license and been there. It's, I think in October 28th, it's going to be two years at that location. Anyway, um, born, I was born and raised in San Luis Obispo, uh, San Luis Obispo High School, uh, Cuesta College, uh, Columbia College. Uh, Matt and my son shared an uh, alumni ship there. Uh, after that, I went to Cal Poly for a master's degree in history, and then on to Columbia University in New York for a master's degree in Islamic studies. 
And now I'm uh, about halfway through my PhD at the University of Oxford in global and imperial history, and I'm studying political economy in Saudi Arabia. Now, what does that have to do with food? Well, uh, it has to do with me being a teacher. I, I also teach at Western College. I've been there for eight years now. I teach history, uh, and I'm able to share this stuff with you. Um, on the restaurant side, I started working in restaurants when I was 14. Uh, any of you locals remember Golden China in San Luis Obispo? That was my first job as a busboy. Uh, throughout uh, my career in the restaurant industry, I've worked every single position. So, busboy, I've been a server, I've worked in the back of the house, I've cooked, uh, done dishes, uh, managed. Uh, and I spent the last, I don't know, 15 years of that, 20 plus years bartending, uh, bartending a few places across town. Um, like I mentioned at the very beginning of this slide, uh, in uh, February of 2020, I opened up Ben's Kitchen, which is a commercial kitchen. It's still there uh, on Foothill Boulevard in San Francisco. My main goal was to um, uh, rent it out to, for, as a catering space. Uh, it turned into a pop-up space, uh, which was really cool, really successful. Uh, that parlayed into Ben's Pizza on Monterey Street. Uh, this experience with opening this commercial kitchen, uh, I'm going to share with you. That's really where I cut my teeth on learning the ins and outs of actually not just working for someone and being an employee and maybe having a uh, servers, a food, food handler certificate, taking that next step and getting the managers, food handlers, getting insurance for the business, uh, actually having to pay rent, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So um, let's dive in. Uh, any questions so far about my background? Okay. So finding the right business model for your new restaurant. So we'll use my example for a second. You know, I was bartending. I was just started teaching at Quest College, or I was a few years into teaching at Quest College. I knew I wanted something different. And it's a little difficult with a lot of the people that I see that have come through my commercial kitchen. They're like, man, I... You know, I'm so good at cooking this and that, or I have my family's recipes and people love them. Like people keep asking me for these things. What do I do? How do I take the next step? Right. And so what you need to do is figure out what next step you want to take. There's multiple options, right? So for me, I was bartending, working at the rest of college, wanted to work for myself. I knew I had skills. And I knew that there was a need in the community, right? And that need in the community at the time was there was only one commercial kitchen. I think now it's so probably three or four, including mine. But at the time, there was only one. And as we know, the wedding industry, uh, the pop-up game, everything in slow is, is in slow County is definitely getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? There's more entrepreneurs coming out and starting these small businesses. And what does everybody need who is starting a small restaurant business need uh, in well, yeah, they all need a commercial kitchen, right? So I started that commercial kitchen. Now, that is an option actually for a business model. Did I put that up there? No, I didn't, but that should be up there. Commer just opening a commercial kitchen in general. And that's the business of uh, renting to these people who want to start small businesses, right? Okay. Now, uh, if you ever gone to a farmer's market or walked around, you'll sell people selling uh, breads or maybe jams, not not uh, shelf stable jams, jellies, fun stuff like that. Uh, those people don't necessarily need a commercial kitchen. I always recommend a commercial kitchen for food, food, uh, uh, you know, ensuring where everything's going to be cooked, etc., etc. But one of the options that you can do is called a cottage permit. Okay. All the information for a cottage permit can be found on the Slow County website. We're going to go through some links later. Um, maybe the next slide or the next slide have the link. We're going to kind of mess around on the Slow County website. But the cottage permit essentially is you're producing food that does not have, uh, that's not shelf stable, meaning you're not like uh, 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 making a, a pizza sauce and then putting it on the shelf like a Newman's Zone or something like that for a year or two years, et cetera. Uh, you're not cooking with uh, eggs, you're not cooking with uh, meat or dairy, okay? So you see cottage permits, a lot of people making bread, um, fun stuff like that, you'll see pop up at the farmer's market. That's going to be super low level. Now, 
These people are cooking out of their homes for the most part, okay? Um, it's kind of, when the health department comes out and you just uh, sign up for a cause for event, they're going to be super strict, right? They're going to come to your house. It's going to be a little invasive. They're going to check out uh, if you have any animals, right? They're going to be really concerned about pet hair, pet dander, you know, kids in the house, kind of the cleanliness of everything, right? They're going to want to make sure that your kitchen is kind of separated from everything else, okay? So be very aware of the cottage submit process if you want to start small like in farmers markets, something like that. Now, uh, you might want to do a catering business. Uh, there, uh, that industry, like I mentioned about a few minutes ago, is blowing up in this area because of weddings. I'd say mainly because of weddings. You'll see a lot of wineries that will want um, like charcuterie boards, wineries that will want people to actually come and cater events for them and pop up. Um, what, I, what I've seen in my experience um, is a lot of chefs at restaurants will uh, break away from their job and say, just like I did, I want to work for myself. And they'll start a catering company. Um, they'll have all the experience, they've probably been in the restaurant industry, cooking for 10, 15, 20 years, and they'll want to break away and make their own money and do their own thing. Make their own hours, uh, I would argue, work even harder than you would if you work for someone else. So that's an option, right, to cater. Uh, there's different, like I mentioned, different facets of catering, uh, you know, wedding pops up, pop ups, charcuterie boards, private parties. Um, you know, uh, uh, Chef Garrett, who runs uh, Chef One Kitchen uh, Slow, uh, kind of does all those things, private parties, weddings. He does pop ups at um, bars without restaurants, fun stuff like that. Um, and that kind of goes into the pop up off location, uh, which is catering. Um, let's let's jump one down. We'll go to the uh, permanent at share kitchen or ghost kitchen in just a second because the food truck is um, food truck is an off location that does require a commercial kitchen. Okay, uh, you'll see a lot of places. Uh, let's see. I'll use the example of uh, the brewery called There's Not Exist and the brewery of. Uh, Liquid Gravity, they're both locally owned, uh, slow, slow city kids, um, great beer, I recommend going there if you can, but um, they rely heavily on food trucks, okay? Um, off the top of my head, I can't really, there's like a grilled cheese project or something along those lines, I'm sorry if anyone's related to that and I'm butchering that, but uh, let's say the, the uh, uh, food truck, uh, wants to pull up and go to Liquid Gravity or go to uh, their not exist and sell food, um, they still need to uh, go to a commercial kitchen and actually have their help commit at a commercial kitchen. So um, food trucks are within a set, they're awesome concepts. You can drive around uh, slow city. I think the city that varies on um, on where you can park them, I think in, in, in San Francisco City, the reason why you're not seeing a lot of um, food trucks is because you have to have a permit to park them on a public street to sell from the city, which is kind of a bummer. Um, I don't know, if, like Roy Grandy, I think, I don't even want to get into that because I don't know. But there are uh, different rules for, for food trucks. Uh, you'll see a lot of food trucks um, on private property, breweries, et cetera. But like I said, food trucks are awesome. Uh, they have their a kitchen that can drive around town. Um, the only thing with those food trucks is that you have to, like I mentioned, San Diego have a commercial kitchen where you have to do all your prep. Have to do all your prep, and you have to um, be able to dump all your, uh, I think it's all gray water, all like the dish water, uh, you know, all the grease, all that kind of fun stuff. You have to have a commercial kitchen that you can dump it. Okay, so uh, be very aware of that. And then we'll jump back up to the permanent share ghost kitchen. So. Uh, I started Benny's at uh, Benny's Kitchen uh, on Foothill, the commercial kitchen, as a um, a spot for caterers to hold their caterers and food trucks to hold their uh, 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 catering license event. Right, like I mentioned, uh, you have to hold your license at a commercial kitchen or a if you're a brick and mortar, your kitchen's fine. That's that's good. Um, and it kind of morphed into this shared ghost kitchen concept, which is really cool. And a lot of people are doing that. It's kind of like the new thing to do is to do a pop-ups or a rotating kitchen. Um, so I became a permanent at my 
commercial kitchen, when I started selling Benny's Pizza. I started selling Benny's Pizza. See, the pandemic shut everything down. I think it was St. Patrick's Day weekend and slow. I started selling pizzas out of the kitchen the next week, uh, or maybe two weeks, when things kind of started chilling out just a little bit. I uh, started selling uh, a pizza out of there, and I was permanent there two days a week. I think that was Tuesday and Friday, okay? Um, and it took off. All my orders were online. Um, I used Square. Uh, I don't, we might discuss that a little bit later. If not, I'll mention it, uh, like what to use for your POS systems. Um, uh, so it was cool. <clears throat> but then what I started, what other people saw, and because of the, the all the, the regulations of COVID, Right, uh, brick and mortar dining restaurants are not open. Right, uh, the timetable of that was some were open sooner or later, and then they closed again. And yeah, we all know that I didn't want to be visited. But what really helped uh, my business at the commercial kitchen was that concept where it was to go food. People could just come in and pick it up. They can do the whole six feet thing. Everyone's wearing masks. Right, no one's sitting down, but you're still able to get food. Um, so that's where the go to the kitchen comfort came in. So at the commercial kitchen in Slow, I rented to uh, a Korean company called Bok Jo. They were very successful. Um, a few other companies, uh, that's just off the top of my head. Uh, very, very successful. There was a, um, a uh, Boba Tea company that worked with Bok Jo and did their own thing. I think SBDC is helping them out. Um, but yeah, uh, the ghost kitchen concept is really cool. So essentially, um, this is that usually what I recommend people do when they start is figure out what you want to do, get all your licensing, find a commercial kitchen, and then kind of put your toes in the pool, right? Uh, figure out, um, you know, what food is selling the best, what's the uh, the, the 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 pricing for the food, what's going to make it the most money. Um, the least amount of work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the ghost kitchen concept, uh, and for those of you who don't know, ghost kitchen is um, or that commercial kitchen, and it's a pop-up through the kitchen. So um, am I explaining this very good? Not really. Uh, so yeah, we use Bob Joe. They're a Korean place. Uh, they didn't have money for a brick and mortar, and they just wanted to pop up every one week, two weeks, put it on Facebook, and make extra money on the side. I think uh, both Matt and his wife both had full time job, and Matt's got Polly, and um, went from there. So, Ghost, Ghost Kitchen is a very viable, that's what I recommend for everyone to do. But then there's the tra traditional brick and mortar. I decided to morph into the traditional brick and mortar for multiple reasons. Mostly, uh, I was able to buy the building, and I bought a liquor license that went with it. So, that's a long term investment for me and for my family. Um, and I felt that that's where I needed to go. Um, a lot of people want a brick and mortar so they can actually have people sit down. And for those of you who don't know, brick and mortar is exactly what I'm saying. It's a permanent structure. It's usually just your restaurant business there, right? Uh, let's use mine as an example up on, on Monterey Street. That's a brick and mortar, Benny's Pizza. Place for people to sit down. Uh, the kitchen is there permanently. We have a permanent staff. We don't share it with anyone. And we make food for people coming in and you make food for people picking up. Okay. Um, okay, oh yeah, I didn't mention the commercial kitchen down the bottom. So uh, that's a lot of word salad there I just gave you. <laughs> um, any questions on any of these things that we can elaborate on or go deeper into? No? Okay. Then let's go to the next one. So, like I mentioned in my intro, that this this is an albatross on a lot of people's nets. How to obtain proper how to obtain proper licensing from local governments. Um, this is kind of scary, and people don't know the process. So, if you're just starting out, and maybe on the last slide you said I want to do a ghost kitchen or I want to do a pop up out of some da -da 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 -da, commercial kitchen, um, what do I do now? Right, I'm so good at making my like, or or whatever it is, I want to put it out in the public and I want to start making money on the side, side hustle, right? What do I do? Pay attention to this, because this is the step-by-step -step on what you're going to need to do to be legal in uh, Slow County. Okay, so um, the order of these is pretty important because you can't get a county health permit without a business license, right? And you need a, et cetera, et cetera. So let, let's start at the beginning. So 
whatever city you're operating out of, and more specifically, um, you need to pick a commercial kitchen that you want to operate out of. Okay, so let's say you're going to operate out of slow. Luckily, there's I think there's a terminal, the terminal kitchen. I think it's called a commercial kitchen. There's slow finest owned by JJ. That's a commercial kitchen, and I have a commercial kitchen. I think there's one more out there. Um, so if you're looking for, uh, if you want to be in slow or have your kitchen in slow, pick a commercial kitchen in slow, and then you need to go to that city uh, government and get a business license. Um, what's kind of cool about the county is that you can, with that county health permit that we're going to talk about in just a second, you can operate your pop-up if you have a catering license anywhere in slow county. So you can operate out of a commercial kitchen, let's say the, the kitchen terminal, you, you shoot them, you have a catering permit through them, which allows you to sell out of that commercial kitchen and do pop-ups on other sites. Um, you can just get it down to the, to the kitchen terminals exactly. Okay. So can you please look up uh, City of Slow business license? And there should be a website. It's, it's really easy. So we'll, uh, at least panel for this post super easy. And if we can share through screen share that and put it up. Okay, super easy. City is low. This is an example for slow. Like let's say I use the example you're using the kitchen terminal. Uh, go talk to the owner. She's a nice lady. I actually haven't met her yet, but here she's a nice lady. Um, kind of figure out, have a discussion on you know what's available, what you want to do. And then she'll be like, oh, uh, I, need the, I need to see your business license. I need to see your health permit. I need to see your insurance. You're like, oh, I don't have any of that. So. You can operate out of the kitchen terminal. You don't even know you want to start a small pop-up business, a catering business. Uh, you'll go to Slow City. And all of this is kind of laid out right here on what to do. Business, license, license basics. Uh, that's pretty much all you're doing, right? You jump into how to get your license. You fill out a small form. You pay for it. I think it's right around $200 right now. Uh, your initial one's pretty basic. You pay for it. They renew it. And then you should get an email like a day later saying, hey, congratulations, you have a city of slow business license. Uh, you will have to put up a little placard on wherever your home office is or your like corporate office, whatever you want to call it. Um, for me, it's my permanent address. So my mother who always gets my mail and complains about it. Um, I had to put a little thing up, I think, for seven days and just to make sure that the, the neighbors are okay with it. But uh, you know, you there's there's a spot for two addresses on there. One's for mailing address and office, and one's for actual like location. You're gonna want to put the commercial kitchen as your location, okay, where, wherever that is, even if you're planning on doing pop-ups around the county. Okay, uh, so pretty pretty good. You have to get a business license, so pay for your business license. And the next thing you have to do is you have to. Can we jump back to the other screen real quick? <laughs> You have to get a fictitious name statement, okay? Um, th that is obtained through the County of Slow. So uh, that's in downtown Monterey Street on the corner of Monterey and Santa Rosa. I say the county clerk reporter. You go in, there's computers there. You can always ask for someone for help to help you out. There's a computer there, it's really, really basic. I think it's like a, right on the screen, there's three or four options. It's fictitious name statement, uh, get a get a birth certificate, get a marriage license, uh, then one's like a death certificate, right? Obviously, you pick the fictitious name statement, okay? And then you have to go and pay for that. So uh, it prints up something for you. You go wait in line. You pay your fee for that. It's really really basic. And they um, they stamp, you know, the the county seal. And what you have to do with that is then you have to uh, find a newspaper that it's going to run your fictitious name statement. I think they have to run it for two weeks, okay? And legally, you can't start doing business until that fictitious name statement has ran its course. Um, I think that that's just to uh, let the community know that you're starting this business. 
Um, also, uh, let someone know if they have the same business name that they're going to come talk to you about it and ask you to change it before any kind of legal stuff happens. Um, what I've found, I've always I've done it twice, right? Uh, four times maybe started businesses and had to go through this process. Um, I will go to the county, I'll pay my fees, I'll get the stamp, all that fun stuff, and then I will walk over to um, the New Times and do it at the New Times. You can do it at New Times, Tribune, um, what other publications? Maybe like this, it has to be in the county, so I can't be San Jose Sun, but any local newspaper that's gonna run something like that for a couple of weeks, um, and they know exactly, you know, if you walk in and say, hey, I need to do a fictitious name statement, it's fine. Any questions on that process? Is past rules the same process to follow? Yes. So I don't know the website. Obviously, I don't know if the website's going to look the same, right? I can't promise that. But it should be the same process. You go in, you get your business license. Uh, then you got to go to the county. And so that petition name statement and process is in the county as well. Okay. So uh, you're initially starting with your city government. And like I said, if you're going to do it in Paso, um, make sure the commercial pitch can pass that, right? Because then um, they might make you change that. I think I think that actually the, the county will point it out. It's the, the, the county and city don't really talk a lot when it comes to these things, um, but you're going to want everything just to kind of be legit. And so, like I said, if you, you're in pass the rubles and you find a commercial pitch and pass on that's where you want to operate on, fine. Um, I believe, and this this would be a question for the city. I think I've seen this before, where they go to Slow City, get the commercial, they get the license, um, the business license, and they put they put my commercial kitchen as the address, the operating address, and then they lived in Napomo, so then they put their Napomo address as their office, and I believe that that worked good. Um, a kind of a um, a, a loose end or kind of a an audible here with this business with this with the business license thing. Um, you can obtain a county business license, and the county business license is going to be. Uh, I've never had to do it, but you go to the, the county office in Slow. Um, I don't know where, probably clerk reporter, uh, and uh, that's for unincorporated. So if there's no city government where you live, um, or like a cottage license thing, right? Uh, you can do it that way. So um, okay. Then to the health permit. So when you go to the health department, um, here in Slow, well, there's uh, but there's two branches that are, you're, you're concerned about the environmental health department. It's like mental health and environmental health. You're, you're concerned with the environmental health department, okay? And the health department um, issues um, health permits, okay? They're the ones that issued the health permits. They're gonna do um, inspections. Um, they're going to do initial inspections. They're going to do ongoing inspections. Uh, they're going to um, make recommendations from those inspections on improvements you need to make. And in some cases, they will actually shut down businesses if they score, I think, below a 70% on the health permit. Um, that's really hard to do, um, but then also really easy to do if there's some massive violations. Um, now, when you go to the, the health department, the environmental health department, um, and you can feel free to call them. They are great. They're excellent on the phone. And their website's very user-friendly. Um, I prefer to just to go in and fill out paperwork by hand. Um, I believe that there's a process. I, you can print stuff up and fill it out, but then you actually have to walk in and pay. Um, so the health permit's going to ask you for your business license, right? Um, so that's really the deal. That's why you have to get this license first. Because without the business license, you can't get your health permit. Okay. Now, when you have your health permit, um, the health permit's going to ask you what kind of license you want. Most of what we cover is going to be uh, handled except for a brick and mortar. It's going to be a catering license. So the food truck license is a really catering license. Okay. Um, but when you're in there, they might suggest a different permit for you, but for the most part, you're going to be looking at off-site catering licenses that require the commercial kitchen, okay? A uh, little side note, if you're opening a commercial kitchen, um, you actually have to get a commissary kitchen permit, okay? So for me, I have a commissary kitchen permit, and I have a catering license. 
out of the uh, Benny's Kitchen location. Out of the Benny's Pizza location, I just have a, um, what is it called? I'm forgetting right now, but we, we're gonna jump onto the county site in a few minutes. And um, it's just a standard of operating license for that, okay? Um, when you go and you get your health permit, you're going to show all your documentation, um, like your business license, uh, uh, you'll pay the fees, you'll tell, you'll fill out the paperwork on your commissary, uh, where, wherever you're ho hosting your commissary, or if you're uh, a brick and mortar, uh, you, you know, the paperwork, there's a place for you to fill out um, where you're going to be operating out of. So like I said, it's commissary, you're going to fill out the information for the commissary, then you actually have to take that uh, there's a special application that the city can, uh, the county can give you. You're going to bring that to the owner of the commissary, and they're going to fill out a little bit of it and sign it for you. Then you bring it back to the health department. Unfortunately, it's a little back and forth. But that's how it goes. If you're doing a brick and mortar in your own business, it's just you doing that. You can do it all there. Super easy. Uh, the health the health department then um, will assign you a health inspector. Um, and then that health inspector will schedule the initial inspection. Okay, so I've probably been through, because I own a commissary kitchen, I've been through 40 to 50 health inspections. Um, and that's a whole other uh, slide, or not slide, but you know, lecture. Uh, we'll handle some of that uh, when we look at um, uh, food handlers permit stuff. Uh, that's all during the process. You learn, uh, you know, proper uh, sanitation buckets and you need soap and you need running water and et cetera, et cetera, right? So the county health, the county health inspectors kind of couldn't get to come out and do an initial inspection. Then after that initial inspection, literally that day, they'll say you're open, you're open for business, okay? Now here, uh, uh, we can jump back and forth on that maybe. Uh, are there any questions on the health permit process? I kind of went over, there's a lot. It can be more complex, but that's kind of the basics. Uh, a question on licensing. Do you need a license in the city and the county if you only plan to operate in one or the other? And do both the city and the county require the efficiency and statement process? Yes. Okay, so sorry. Uh, let's start with the first one. Um, you're going to want to work. Okay, so commissary kitchen, right? Start with that. If you are doing a pop-up, let's say you're catering weddings, right? Or you're popping up at the breweries, it's going to be under the same county catering license. Um, you're going to want to get that business license in the city where the commissary that you're attached to is. Okay, does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I understand your question because it's, it's, it's ambiguous. Like, so I'm guessing you live in an unincorporated area, and that's why you're asking this question. I would just refer to Wherever your commissary kitchen is, is to get a business license in that town. That's the best thing to do. I uh, it was a little it's it like a gray area. Like I had a couple, I had a woman who makes salsa out of her house, out of a cottage license, and and she had a county business license. So I asked her to see her business license because that's a requirement of running the kitchen also. And she's like, oh well, I, I have my county business license. Is that good? I said, well, you'll probably need to get a, a city business license, but if the health department's okay with that, then they're okay with that. So that's kind of a question for them. But if you're starting new, highly recommend getting that business license in the city where the commercial kitchen is. Uh, the second question had to do with fictitious name statement. Mm -hmm. Is it required to do it both city and Yeah, it's it's a requirement for the state. So you have to you have to do that. So if you go to the county and get a business license in the county. They're going to say you need to file your petition name statement. Okay, so for both of those, it's the same process. Unfortunately, it's a economic and kind of time step you have to take. Now, there's a, there's the, ne the next two items on the slide. Um, uh, people forget, <laughs> and it's a big deal. Um, the California State Sales Permit. Can we go to that site? So, what the sales permit essentially is is. Um, it's free, doesn't cost anything. The state gives it to you. Uh, it's a really simple form, but you have to have a business license first, right? They they want to know your legitimate business in California. Okay. So here it is, seller's permit. Now, make sure when you Google California seller's permit, you can either follow that link, send it right here. And here's some Q&As, really basic stuff. Um, kind of uh, cruise through this, check it out. 
But what the California seller's permit is, is, is California wants to track what you're selling. Now, why would they do that? Right? Any, any, uh, anyone have any ideas on why California wants to know what you're selling? Because California wants to track the sales plus tax you're collecting. Okay. So when you sign up for your California sales permit uh, and you get a login and there's a portal for you, um, when you're first starting off, you're going to report once a year. And then after that, they'll probably want you to report quarterly, depending on how much money you make. So essentially, whatever POS system you use, you're going to put in your gross sales, which is going to be your sales tax collected plus your net, right? What you're selling your product for. And then the state is going to want their money. Okay. Uh, my first business I started uh, when I'm, I don't know, 21, it was a wedding photography business. I didn't even know this existed. So I, in my first year of business, I'm getting calls from the state saying, hey, uh, we see that you're a business, you know, because they, <laughs> I, got, I got a business license, so they, you know, we see you're a business, uh, how much money did you make last year? We needed the sales tax to collect. Oh my gosh. This gets a lot of people in trouble, okay? Um, I think there was a, um, a local automotive owner, a business owner that um, didn't pay his sales tax for like two years, and I think he's in prison right now. So this is a big deal, and they're going to come after you. So this is a very important step to take. Uh, get your get your county, uh, sorry, your state your seller permit, and then you actually have to separate your sales tax collected. So then, when you owe it, you can pay it to them, and you won't go to jail because they actually do. They will send you to jail for not paying your, your state taxes collected. It's a big deal. Um, for me at Benny's Kitchen, I don't know, we collect, sorry, Benny's Pizza uh, on Monterey Street, we collect, I don't know, between four and $6,000 a month on sales tax. And so uh, I put that in a different account. So when it's due quarterly, um, you know, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000, it's there. I'm not stressing about it. Okay, we go back to the other page. And another thing um, that a lot of people don't forget that it's extremely important, if you try to rent from me or try to rent from the kitchen terminal, they're going to say, where is your insurance policy? So everyone has to get a basic life, at least the basic liability insurance policy. At my commercial kitchen, I have a very large multi-million dollar insurance policy, right? Because I'm actually hosting other people. And then what I ask, and any restaurant business needs to do this. You're not required to do this unless you want to rent from a commercial kitchen that requires it, but highly, 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 highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. I would say you do it no matter what. You get insurance policy. This is gonna be a, a regular liability insurance policy that's gonna cover everything from um, foodborne illnesses, like if you're catering and you get someone sick, um, to uh, you're in a commercial kitchen and you start a fire and you have to use a suppression system and that suppression system costs uh, uh, you know a couple thousand dollars and you don't have that have insurance on it or if you someone falls down when an employee falls down anything like that you have to have this basic insurance policy now if you were to google can we jump over to, to uh, a google a google I sound uh, you know um, Getting a call from one of my uh, kitchen managers. If you just type in um, like restaurant insurance policy, all the big companies have policies. Yeah, super easy. I think the one that like Geico. Hartford is ours that we use in Benny's uh, Pizza, Progressive Commercial, right? Food, Lightning. So look into that, find the best one. We'll talk to different people. What I'm hearing from my um, the people who do pop ups out of Benny's Kitchen, they're spending, I don't know, $75, $100 a month on this insurance. Um, get it, though. Get it, get it, get it, get it. So that's another one of those things that people don't think about. So they're starting a company, but you can get that insurance. Like I said, um, most commercial kitchens, if they do their due diligence, are going to require you to have that. And so I require uh, people who rent from me to have that for those issues I, I just explained. Like if the suppression system goes off or 
or someone slips and falls, uh, they're going to go to that their uh, that business's insurance company first, and then they'll jump to mine if it's real big. So, uh, cool. Um, on the insurance side, I've got a question. Do I need to insure my auto for business use if using it to deliver food? Yes. So that's going to be a discussion you're going to have with um, the insurance company. So I have a van that I bought for Benny's Kitchen. And it's kind of cool because then you get to write off, if it's part of the business, you get to write off a lot of stuff with that. Talk to your accountant about that. That's definitely not what I do. But um, yes, if you're delivering it in your car, you will need um, the, pol the policy to cover that. Here's another fun thing, not so fun. Um, if you're delivering in your car, the county is going to want to know that with the health permit process, and they're going to want to inspect your vehicle. So if you have like a 92 Honda Civic, nothing against them, but they're probably not the best for delivering uh, large amounts of food and weddings, right? Uh, and if you have a dog in there and everything else, you get what I'm saying, right? So um, you need to run all that. I would, you know, if you're planning on doing this with a car, go talk to the health department. Like I said, they're really easy to talk to. Uh, go, go tell them what you want to do, tell them what kind of car you have. Like I said, the inspector's going to want to inspect that car if you're doing deliveries in that car. Okay. Um, and that was a really good question. Anything else? Okay. Can we jump over to the, the so uh, this website right here is the, oh, you can find anything county health related. So if you can jump on that link on the bottom. So all these right here. Um, you know, like a mobile food facility, that, that would be like a food truck. Temporary food facility, that'd be like a pop up at a winery. Um, uh, I was trying my hardest. Oh, no, uh, where was it? It's, it's later on um, in the slides. On my, if you're setting up a, um, uh, a brick and mortar, you're setting up a commercial kitchen, like what, you, what the county requires you to have. Uh, like a three compartment sink, you have to have floor drains, you have to have a, a hand washing sinks with soap and paper towels. There's all kinds of stuff. So um, this is a good page to go to if you're thinking about starting stuff up. Um, and like I said, you can call the health department. They're actually the ladies who work up front and for the people, ladies and gents that work up front are, are awesome. So um, any questions on any of this? This is kind of, it's a lot, I know. No. And I would, you know, like, like I said, this, it can be kind of confusing. So I would uh, definitely just call the health department and say, this is what I want to do. What direction should I go in? And whenever I'm calling the health department, I call them a couple of times a year. I will get on the web page and go over it with them, and they'll tell me exactly where to go. When I was making this uh, presentation, I, I did the same thing. I, I talked to the lady in the front. She, to kind of set me to this page, which I think is the best one. Okay, so for time purposes, move on. Any questions, concerns? Okay, so this is like the bulk of, of what most people have issues with. So that's why we spent like a good half an hour. Okay. All right, let's move on. Okay, this is the second kind of big thing. It's pretty self-explanatory, so we're not going to spend too much time on this. If you've been in the restaurant industry, like you've bartended or you've been a server or even a cook in the back, uh, you're required to have a food handler certificate, okay? Usually, it's just um, like a server. It's called a server. I think it's the servers and a manager that are the, are the two different, or yeah, food handler, not server, sorry. Food handler, then there's a manager's. The... Um, like I said, you've been in the service industry for a while, you probably have this. Uh, your employer probably paid for it. It's a couple hours training, and then you do an online test. Pretty basic, pretty easy. Everyone has it. I've done this many times in my life. Um, but when you own a business, you can't just have the food with the regular food games. You have to have the managers, okay? And the county health department's gonna require that. That's gonna be part of them signing off on your health permit. Now, I've seen some situations where there's like a husband wife or a partnership where one partner has the manager's certificate and the other one doesn't, and the health department signs off on that. They say it's fine. 
The rule is with the health department, they're going to want uh, at least, they're going to want all your employees to have the basic level, right? So if anyone's making food, handling food, you're going to have the basic level of your food handlers. If you own the business, they're going to want you to have the manager's food handlers uh, certificate. Um, and they want that, they want at least one person to, to always have the manager's food handler certificate. I got a little ahead of myself. I didn't explain even what we're talking about. Okay, uh, the food handler certificate is a is a certificate given by private companies. Uh, I, there's dozens of these companies that actually issue these things. Um, there's a list down there. We'll look at it in just a second. Um, but what the food handler is, is essentially a third party. Um, you go through training. There's two levels, like I mentioned. There's the uh, there's the basic food handlers and there's the managers, right? Uh, the training includes proper food storage, uh, like in the refrigerator, like what kind of raw meat goes below or above others, uh, how to keep vegetables, how to, you know, keeping, uh, you know, uh, sanitizer buckets, um, what is the proper, you know, temp to bring food up to so it kills bacteria, how long you can hold certain foods in certain temp, uh, proper refrigeration temperatures, freezer temperatures. Uh, uh, all of that stuff is covered. It's it's very the manager's one is very 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 detailed. Okay, um, like I said, the health department's going to require you to have more food handlers, managers to start a business. Okay, now like I mentioned at the very beginning, the basic food handlers is really easy. You go online, you go to one of these companies, you can pick which one works best for you. Usually, it's based on pricing, to be honest, and then you go from there. The managers. Uh, more detail, okay? Um, you have to buy a test. Now, there's a lot of options. They'll want to sell you books. They'll want to sell you uh, uh, online seminars you can watch, in-seat seminars you can go to. Um, me being in the service industry for so long, I bought a, like, uh, I think ServSafe sold some sort of cheat sheet. Um, it's not really cheating. You understand what I'm saying? It's kind of like a like a the main points, right? Um, uh, I did that. And then with the managers, and it's kind of a pain. You can't just go online and take the multiple choice uh, test like the basic food handlers. You actually have to have it proctored. So you can get it proctored, which we all know what proctored means, right? Like someone sits there and watches watch you take the test. Um, I chose to get a proctor, not in person. I chose to do it online. It was also, it was right before COVID, so that was not an issue yet. Um, so you, it's an extra expense. I think I had to pay $180 for the proctor. So even within ServeSafe, which is a company that sells the test, which you have to buy the test independently, it sounds funky. They sell the books, they sell the materials, they sell the online lectures you can take and the NC lectures you can take. For service day, they hire contractors to do, be the proctor. So when you hit up service day, they'll hire a proctor. They're going to say, "Shit, from this is the proctors." So it's it's a little complex. It's, there's a learning curve there, but be ready for that. So I bought a lecture. I mean, I'm sorry, I bought a uh, a test. I bought a cheat sheet, and it's all kind of there on on the web page. Um, and service day, I'm just using this because I have mine is in service day. It's really easy. Uh, we'll look at the list in a second. You can pick from any of them. The health department also gets our copy list at the front desk. Okay, check that out. Um, I hired uh, the proctor, third party proctor, and I took the exam. Um, it's, you know, they, you have to turn your camera on and your laptop. You can't use any notes. They want to listen to you. They want to see everything you're doing. So it's it's pretty hard to pour, okay? Uh, and um, I think you, it's like an 80% pass rate or something along those lines. I uh, passed it my first time. I think I missed two or three questions. Um, but it's just like anything. You kind of got to put some effort into it to study. So um, any questions on this? And like I said, it's very important. You have to have this to get your, your health permit. Can you click on that link? So this is a national credit accreditation board for food handlers. Certificates. So if you scroll up and down, you'll see all these. And it's kind of cool, it's kind of linked. So you can pick one. Yes, this this really reminds me of uh, when you get your speeding ticket and you go to tax school. 
And there's that big old list I give you. So uh, I chose SurfSafe uh, just because I've, that's what I've always done for the past 15, 20 years. But as you can see, there's a whole bunch. The health department will be able to answer some questions for this. I don't think that they're really detailed in it. But um, when you do go uh, for your for your um, initial inspection, the uh, inspector's going to want to see this. So what I do is I just have it available by email. I have some people in the kitchen that will print them up and just put it in a little binder. So this needs to be done. Any questions? No. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So this kind of matches up with uh, one of the first slides we went on, uh, on what type of kitchen space is appropriate for your new restaurant business. This image, if not my kitchen, but my commercial kitchen could look just like this. Um, really basic, right? It's got the basics of a commercial kitchen. It's got counter space, it's got dry storage space, it's got that three compartment sink, it's got a floor drain, uh, it's got the hood, it's got the type one hood with the suppression system, and it has the appliance system and these common refrigerators over here, right? Basic commercial kitchen. Um, like we discussed earlier, you need to know what kind of business you want to run. Uh, commercial kitchens are great for catering. They're great for doing ghost kitchen pop-ups. Now, not every commercial kitchen you can actually sell food out of. And so that's a little caveat also the health department's going to talk to you about. Uh, the kitchen terminal, they actually, their, their, their zone will let you, so you can actually sell food out of there. I think um, Ebony, uh, Ebony, is that the company? Uh, they do Ethiopian food, awesome food. She started in my kitchen for a second, then she went over to the kitchen terminal because she needed more space. Uh, kitchen terminals is, is zoned for takeout also. My commercial kitchen uh, used to be an old Papa John's, so it has a front counter area, and that's zoned for takeout too. So if you want to do a, uh, a ghost kitchen pop-up out of the commercial kitchen you're using, it has to be zoned for that. So talk to the owner and talk to the health department because they have a big list and they, they know what's up. Okay, so um, if you, let's just say you're doing uh, wedding catering, you're doing charcuterie boards for a wedding, then you don't need to be really concerned about that, right? But you're going to need that commercial kitchen, okay? So go check it out. Advantages of a commercial kitchen, low cost for the most part. Um, if you're doing a catering thing, that's what you're going to want. If you're doing a pop-up at There Is Not Exist or the Gravity, you're going to want just you don't need you don't need to pay the extra money to have to, to to be able to sell your product out of that commercial kitchen direct to the public with the public order from that commercial kitchen, right? Disadvantages kind of of a commercial kitchen is you're sharing it with people. Um, <clears throat> people might be leaving food behind. Uh, you know, there's always um, you know, hey, someone so used my soap. Or so and so used some saran wrap of mine, or so and so uh, left a huge mess that I had to clean up, right? So in these commercial kitchens, it's a shared space. The busier a commercial, uh, a commercial kitchen is, of course, the, the more issues you're going to have with other businesses that are sharing your space. Um, there's really like I highly recommend everyone if they're starting out, they don't have a lot of money. Uh, and restaurants can be very expensive very quickly um, to start in a commercial kitchen. Get your feet wet. See if this is really the right thing for you. I've had probably half a dozen people come through my kitchen and say, this is my dream. This is what I want to do. And back, I was mentoring them through all of this stuff. They come in, they get all their stuff. It's been about $800,000 on all that stuff. They spend some time. And then they would figure out two, three months into it, yeah, this is too much work, or I don't really want to do this anymore. So that's an advantage of a commercial kitchen, is that you're not, you know, mortgaging the house or, you know, spending juniors college money on your restaurant, right? okay? Um, when, you, when you're when you looking at a commercial kitchen, you're going to look at the, at the cost breakdown. Um, what the cost per hour is, what the initial, what the additional fees are, uh, like cleaning fees or just maintenance fees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, different commercial kitchens charge different things. So always make sure to check that out and to price that out. Always get quotes 
And what I've seen, for the most part, the more hours you get from a commercial kitchen, the more you can kind of negotiate, okay? Um, also be very aware that you're not only paying for the hours you're using the kitchen, you're also going to be paying for storage space, dry storage, meaning like you see here in the picture, uh, where you're going to put your canned goods and stuff that the health department lets you leave out, like flour and stuff like that. And then also cold storage and frozen storage. Cold storage is going to be in a refrigerator or a walk-in cooler. Uh, uh, frozen storage obviously is in a freezer. Okay, so be very aware of those top breakdowns. I was going to mention something, I just forgot. Come back to that. Uh, I'll come back to the brick and mortar. Advantages, disadvantages. Obviously, advantages is your space. Uh, unless you decide to rent it on the side of people, which a lot of brick mortars do uh, at cost. But uh, it's your own space. Uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about food walking away with a different business. Um, uh, you know, if you leave a mess, it's yours to clean up type thing. Um, and you're kind of responsible, right? Like the health department's not going to come in and ding you for someone else's mess. If it's your mess, it's your mess. You, you, you do that. The disadvantage of, of having your own brick and mortar is it's very expensive. We're going to go over some of those costs at the very end. Um, water. Oh, that's what I was going to get to. Water, utilities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, with the brick and mortar, it's very expensive. Whether you, you know, whether you're open for 20 hours a week or you're open for 80 hours a week, you're paying the same rent, right? With a commercial kitchen, if you're contracted for 20 hours a month, then you're only paying that rent, right? So it's there's so many advantages starting out, and I kind of recommend you start out a commercial kitchen. To go back to that commercial kitchen, what's also extremely beneficial is that uh, in that per hour cost is going to be. Um, for the most part, double check with that commercial kitchen. With mine, it is. It's industry standard. Uh, that twenty dollars an hour, let's just say, that you're renting from me or renting from a commercial kitchen, that's going to include the gas that you use, the electricity that's on, um, the rent of the building, right? So it's very low cost, uh, advantageous for the uh, uh, renter, right? Go back down to the brick and mortar. That cost, you're going to be paying that rent no matter how much you use it. Those electricity bills, they add up, they're crazy. Um, you know, trash bills. Uh, now, uh, you know, if, if you own a kitchen, you have to have your grease trap professionally cleaned uh, once a month. All those things add up, right? That you're not necessarily paying. It's all built into the cost for hourly for your commercial kitchen. Any questions? Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is uh, going to be handled with your, the health permit's going to require this. You're going to learn about um, state, California state law on where you're going to pick up your food from, okay? Uh, essentially, it's really basic. It says that you have to, uh, uh, so the slide called the basics of ordering food and obtaining vendors, right? The state of California is going to say you have to get your food that you serve to the public from approved vendors. It's so very ambiguous. It's like, well, what does that mean, right? Um, essentially, when you're buying food for your business, let's say you, you, you've got your licensing, you figured out what you want to do, you're going to do a, well, no, a mobile, a mobile, I'm going to go back to Lumpia. I don't know that I guess I want Lumpia today. Uh, mobile Olympia wedding catering. And now you need to get food, right? You find a commercial kitchen, you want to offer it up, you have all your equipment, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and now you want to find a good way to find all the vegetables and all the meat uh, to uh, put into your vegetable, right? You have a lot of different options, okay? You can go to, I started off going to Smart and Final, and a lot of restaurant owners, you'll catch a Smart and Final, but we're mostly getting the stuff that either Jordano's or U.S. Foods, one of those big companies forgot or we ran out of, we need to go run there real quick. When I started Benny's Pizza, I just went to Smart Final. It was a sharp learning curve for me. You can go to any grocery store, buy food, to make food, to sell it. 
any grocery store in California, because those grocery stores hopefully are going to have those county health permits also, right? So that's going to be approved vendor for you to buy stuff. Now, as you grow bigger, right, you're going to want to tap into those those large companies, like I said, Jordano's, U.S. Foods. Uh, there's a whole gamut of them, right? And believe me, when you start a business, those people are going to, those sellers, those, they're going to come by and start giving you their business card and say, hey, we can deliver food these days. Start an account, no problem. That's a great way to get food also. Because remember, it's not always the freshest, right? Now, let's jump over to a company like um, uh, Novo here in town, right? Novo is very well known for having fresh food. And they actually hired, they have one full-time employee that just goes to the farmer's markets, right? And they pick up food from farmer's markets every day to use fresh in their food. Now, that can be a gray area, right? But all of those people selling at farmer's markets should have some sort of county health permit, whether it's cottage or some sort of seller's permit that allows them to actually sell food. Okay, so you can go to farmer's markets and get food, okay? I've also seen, and this is the really gray area, people be like, oh, I cooked it, my, I threw this food in my home garden. That's something that, that the health department I don't think would be okay with. Um, now, the reason why the health department wants to know all this, and, why you, and the state also requiring this, is that they wanna make sure if like there's an outbreak of something, salmonella or something along those lines, they wanna be able to trace it back. Where it came from. Okay. So if you got it, if you get it from Smart, you got some lettuce from Smart and Final, and in the salad, people get sick, they're going to know to trace it back to Smart and Final. Okay. And then that's going to help your business because then you can push it to them and, and everything. Else, okay. Um, any questions on this? I'm kind of breezing through this quick so we can have some time. No? Okay. Next slide. So we're kind of uh, kind of all over the place. Uh, like I said, this is just an overall uh, shell of kind of starting a restaurant business. Okay, each of these slides could be a whole multi-hour uh, lecture. Um, I mentioned that when I started my business, the pandemic hit, and I was funky. I uh, I guess I'm showing my age, but uh, you know, Facebook was my thing, right? And so I started advertising. I started a Facebook page for Benny's. Uh, Benny's Pizza, which was free, started a page. And I started advertising on that page. But then through word of mouth, uh, and um, I, know I knew some people who worked at the, uh, for New Times, I, worked, I knew some people who worked for the radio stations. I was like that underground secret pizza place, right? Um, and so some sort of myth was created uh, by accident. I wouldn't say uh, a little bit of intention, but a lot of accident and people kind of liking the idea of this underground pizza place. Uh, started a social media page on Facebook, uh, eventually went to Instagram. I still have both. Benny's Pizza Slow on Instagram, Benny's Pizza on Facebook. Um, and that's my brick and mortar at 1601. But what's really good about social media is it's free, right? And or low cost. So every day um, I post uh, on both Instagram and Facebook. I post daily specials. I post, um, uh, we have a pizza of the month that I post. I post our lunch specials. Uh, we have a full bar, so I post bar specials. We uh, we have music four nights a week, so I'll post what music is playing. And I post throughout the day, right? What's funky about Facebook and Instagram is that they, they got smart about it too. They figured out that all these small businesses are posting and it's free advertising and da 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 da, -da. Um, So they'll switch up the algorithms, and a lot of people won't see a lot of the stuff that I'm posting. Now, the answer to that is to um, use their paid ads, okay? Both Facebook and Instagram have, um, you know, uh, you can boost your post or you can pick your demographic, and that's actually really cool. Uh, when I was first messing around with Facebook, they had targeted ads. And I kind of wasn't paying attention on how to do it. I just kind of paid the five bucks. You can actually, there's a sliding scale and how long you want the, the ad to be up and who you want it to reach and how far you want it to go. I kind of just posted an ad and paid five bucks, right? I was getting emails or messages on Facebook from dudes in like Louisiana 
like ask me when I was helping. And, <laughs> and some dudes were very forward, like, hey, you're an idiot. Why don't you fix your, your, your uh, distance, right? So it was a learning curve for me to figure out that. But that's something that's really great for these things. It's very low cost advertising. And everybody's on social media, right? I highly recommend you start off doing the free stuff here, okay? Um, also on Facebook and Instagram, on Instagram, there's a lot of inf like local influencers, way more than you know. A bunch of Cal Poly kids are like taking their friends out to taste food and they want to post on it. Um, there's underground people doing um, stuff on Reddit, right? Um, off the top of my head, I'm kind of forgetting what their names are, but it's, it's a group of women in their 30s that are all moms that go around and, and go and taste food and then post it, like girls, hungry girls or something like that. And so there's all these groups, right? So try to get those people to come taste your food, to do pop-ups, um, all that fun stuff. And um, like I'll use Garrett's example for the Szechuan Kitchen Slow that pops up out of the kitchen. Um, you know, they, they pop up, uh, he pops up with, um, with Saints Barrow, which is great. They work together good. And they're like cross promoting each other constantly, right? So you'll, you'll get a lot of that. Um, back to Facebook, the targeted ads, like I said, they work great. Also on Facebook, there's uh, groups, local groups that you can find. I think one of them is called Central Coast Foodies. And so people kind of do their own reviews, but the admin of that group in particular will allow businesses to post once a day on that. You can't take direct orders from the page. That's kind of their rules. But that's a great way for you to reach 10,000 people locally is to say, hey, I'm starting this new business. It's a pop-up. It's doing Lumpia out of the you know, kitchen terminal or in the kitchen or wherever you choose to be. Um, come check it out. You can put your opening days, maybe a link for ordering, right? And it's great. So I highly recommend that. Paid advertisement, like I mentioned, um, like paid social media on both Instagram and Facebook. That's a very low cost way to do it. That's, I recommend starting off free, but then kind of bumping up those, you know, ads. Um, radio, I, I, you know, all the, when you see if you open a brick and mortar or some of those radio uh, salesmen uh, uh, find you, they'll stop by all the time. Uh, I have a stack of business cards from one dude that uh, about every six months I give them back to him. He literally comes, Twice a week, he leaves a business card. It's yeah, that's his thing. Um, radio is expensive, um, and it does work. I've done radio a few times, it's like a, 800 to a thousand dollars a month, you know. So, um, depending on your budget, what you want to do, it does work. I, I was having people coming in saying, Hey, I, I heard your radio, it was fun, you know. Um, it's kind of hard to track that. There are different echelons within these advertising uh, advertisements on like, hey, we can track this or digital ads. You know, like if you ever wondered if you, if you don't pay for your Pandora or your Spotify, you see local ads pop up. That's because someone, you know, the salesman contacted the business and they contracted through and now your ads are on uh, Spotify if you don't pay. Okay. But then of course with television, um, very rare that we see television ads for restaurants, television ads are extremely expensive, uh, but you do see them. So any, any questions on the basics of advertising for promotion? Uh, we have one question. Yeah. For bars, the place is likely with gravity. Who pays who to have food truck at their brewery? And then who does the food truck keep? Or, and then does the food truck keep all the persons? Good question. Um, there are different ways we can set up um, that process and even like a commercial kitchen process where a commercial kitchen hosts um hosts pop like pop-up businesses a lot of times the owner of that commercial kitchen will, will say hey you don't got to pay me rent just give me 10 percent of the sales or something like that that's the same kind of way that like it you know they draw private businesses they can do whatever they want they can say hey if you're going to pop up here i want 10 percent of your business right um i know they could grab me um, they just want to provide food for people. Like they want people to come to the brewery. And I'm using them as an example because I grew up with Brendan and I did a pop up there during COVID for a year. They'll say, hey, come to Liquor Gravity, get a beer, and there will be Corazon, Corazon 805, right? I think SBDC is worth it. Great food. 
Um, uh, they'll say, hey, come pop. There's the Corazon 805s here. You don't have to leave. Bring the kids. You guys can get dinner, hang out, bring the dog, listen to some music, all that fun stuff. So they wanted like a like a one-stop shop, right? Um, now, during COVID, um, there was those special regulations, right? Like you had to buy food to get a beer, all that fun stuff. It, was, it worked great for me because I got to sell a slice for every single beer they sold, right? Uh, what they did is they just, they collected everything with their POS system. They gave someone a ticket and then I can't give up this pizza. Then Liquid Gravity wrote me a check and I was a contractor for them, right? Um, but Liquid Gravity, I know now, will just say, hey, food truck, we need you on Wednesday, come out. And the food truck will come out. Now on the flip side of that, a lot of food trucks, it's very expensive to do stuff like this. You're, you're in, the time, the food you're prepping, you know, in, 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 unless you're constantly doing your food truck with the same menu and you can use that food left over for the next day or the next day, a lot of food trucks will say, I want a minimum, right? And what that minimum is, is they'll say, hey, liquid gravity, I'm gonna come out to your place. I want you to guarantee that we're gonna sell 500 to $1,000 or let's say 750. And I guarantee that there's $750 in sales collected for me to be here. Then at the end of the night, if there's not 750, let's say the food truck sold 550, they're going to want a 200 dollars check from liquid gravity to make up that 750. That makes sense. So that happens a lot. Uh, I know Celeste over there; she's great. Um, so they don't do minimums. They're just like, hey, if you want this opportunity, come up. And they they really have no problem. But what you see sometimes with on that side of it is. Oh, hey, we don't have food today, so feel free to like order pizza in or DoorDash or whatever it is. So um, it goes both ways. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, next slide. Okay. This is second to last slide, right? We can get on time. Yeah. Uh, yes. This is, this is like, the whole semester course right here that we're going to talk about in five minutes. The, ba the basic eco uh, economics of running a restaurant. Um, there's so much to this. Um, I can't like tell people enough when they're starting restaurants to start off small and slowly build, constantly reinvest. Start off with that commercial kitchen. Figure out what people want, what the need in the community is. You know, slowly buy equipment that you can afford. Don't get in massive debt. Don't spend junior's money on a new refrigerator. You know, make money and then buy it. At Benny's uh, brick and mortar on 1601, my overhead is close, I don't know, between 60 and $65,000 a month. Uh, that means we have to bring in at least that much money, right? To pay the employees, to pay the vendors, et cetera, et cetera. Very expensive. But you need to be very aware of this. Um, there's stuff that, are, that, are, that is constant. So you're startup and your yearly fees. We already went over the fees and the licensing to start up, okay? All those permits, you have to, every year, re-up them. Uh, for closed fee for the business license, you have to put in your yearly sales. And then based on that yearly sales, they tack on a nice little fee. So I think the basic, Business license this year for Benny's Pizza was like a fifty-three dollar renewal. But then after I put in that we our gross income was nine hundred fifty thousand or whatever it was, they tacked on an extra two hundred eighty dollars, right? And then they do audits. They want to make sure it's your taxes. To, you know, so they want their money. The health department is is a little more lenient. They're going to want their eight hundred dollars a year to re up or whatever it is. And it's not eight. It's eight hundred because we're multiple licenses and everything. It's, it's, you know, they have all the fees there, but it's it's a couple hundred dollars to re-up. Um, food handlers permit. You have to re-up that. I think the managers is actually five managers. So that's another three, four, five hundred dollars you can spend, right? So you have to keep up on those licensing, right? Because luckily, fictitious bank statement is a one time done. Uh, the county stuff, one time done, you don't have to do it again. But be very aware of those fees, right? Obviously, your insurance premiums, um, you know, like when you start having a lot of employees also, which we didn't talk about, is going to be uh, less their labor, actually. Unemployment insurance, employment taxes. I was just griping about that before we started this lecture. Um, so, yeah, be very aware of those reoccurring fees licensing every year, every month, whatever it is. 
Um, if you do not rent from a commercial kitchen and you have a brick and mortar, those initial equipment fees, very expensive. If you buy used equipment, depending on the dollars, but then you're also going to repair them more, you have warranties. If you're buying new equipment, I mean, strap in and get ready to spend fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 initially for equipment. Constantly fixing those things. We have um, my uh, cold, cold refrigerator guy uh, in one of my kitchens at least once a month. I have Lou, my, my gas company dude that fixes uh, 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 stoves yeah. once a month. You know, just always something's going wrong. So just keep in mind that those are some fees, right? That you're gonna have to put money aside, or not fees, but just uh, equipment upkeep, buying new equipment. Something might crap out, you have to buy something new, or the needs of the, of the facility or needs of your customers or your employees, you're like, hey, Ben, we need this knife sharpener, can you get it for us? There's constant stuff and they kind of somehow project and vision for those things, okay? Then the recurring monthly costs, rent or mortgage, right? This is if you have a brick and mortar. Actually, it's gonna go for a uh, commercial kitchen too, obviously your hourly rent. Um, if you have a brick and mortar, it's going to be your utilities. Those are, I mean, running refrigerators is insane, right? Like a walk-in cooler, my one at uh, Benny's Kitchen is, I don't know, $400 a month. So be just be aware of those costs, okay, and budget for this. Um, gas, right? Um, all that fun utility stuff. But then there's those um, necessities like trash bags, rags, soap sanitizer, all those things that like you don't really think about, but they're there and they cost additional costs, okay? You have to budget all of that in. Um, packaging, to-go, uh, bags, uh, those, little, those little things with the uh, fortune knives, um, all that fun stuff, uh, napkins, right? All of that you need to think about. And that's stuff that is like locking out the door. Now, all of this, keep in mind, you're going to price with your food. That's a whole other lecture within, within itself is figuring out what your food cost is, your labor cost is, your supply cost, putting that all into um, a way to figure out what you're gonna charge, right? Um, like I said, I don't wanna get into that because it's a very large discussion. You can usually Google like, how do I price my restaurant food? There's a lot of different suggestions for that, okay? Um, labor, labor is very expensive. Um, I think, Depending on how big your company is, we're at fifteen dollars an hour, I believe, right? Basic um, minimum wage. Uh, I pay my employees sixteen, and I have for two years. Uh, my front of the house guys, the back of the house, are more, um, and so those costs are going up. I think twenty twenty four is going up to sixteen with uh, a bill in the California Senate that wants to bump it to twenty dollars an hour. I think by twenty twenty five. I just saw an article on that. So. Labor is very expensive. Now, you're paying an hourly wage, okay? Now, you also need to remember you need to buy an employment tax, okay? That's through, like, we use Morris and Garitano. They set us up. Our premiums are like $800 a month or something like that. That's essentially saying if an employee gets hurt or they, they get fired uh, unjustly, they can file an employment tax uh, insurance. And then they file a claim, and if it gets approved, it, it's... Like your insurance that you're paying for pays that person's salary. That's a whole other base I'm not gonna talk about, but that's something to budget in employment tax. Employment insurance, sorry. And then there's employment taxes through the federal government, okay? Uh, it actually costs money to employ people. You pay taxes on it. Interesting concept. Um, but that's very expensive. So be very mindful of that. So if you're paying someone $16 an hour, you need to factor in what your employment insurance is going to tack out to that, maybe a dollar, maybe 50 cents. And then uh, the employment taxes on top of that are going to be paying the federal government. So, you know, $16 an hour, you're like, oh, cool, I'm going to hire this for 16. In reality, you're paying them 18 to 20. Okay. So be very aware of that. Like I said, you're going to want to price all of this in to your food costs and what you're going to sell people, uh, sell your food at. Uh, unfortunately, at Fannie, we have to raise our prices. Uh, we have, you know, we have, I don't think we've raised our prices yet. Maybe not a few things, but you know, food costs, and that's the next thing, food costs. Um, we see everyone griping about that too. Food costs continuously rise and rise and rise and rising, even with the vendors like Jordanum's or US Foods. Food costs continue to rise. In restaurants, super thin margin because we have all of this other stuff. 
So we have to kind of keep up with that, right? And a lot of people aren't happy. Uh, our customers aren't happy, um, but it's just the reality that we're kind of in if we want to make any sort of money for our labor, our work that we're doing. Um, and then obviously sales tax collected, I went over that, super important. Um, the rest of this stuff, right? You, you might get a bad name and you might go into debt and you might have to file for bankruptcy and be stressed out, but they won't put you in prison. They won't put you in prison if you don't pay your sales tax. So make sure you do that, right? Do that, do that, do that. Uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, any questions on this? Could you, could you talk about uh, food costs and just overall cost of things that relates to growth and net margins? Like if you're uh, so, so $20 pizza, you know. So, yeah, in relation to that, what's yeah. your net in relation to that? Yeah, what's your labor in relation to that? Yeah, so kind of, kind of, and I'll just go over some basics and we can talk later on this. Um, but you're going to want your labor, right? There's a couple different formulas. You're going to want your labor to be around 30%. Uh, they say golden rule, you keep it below 30, 32% on labor, at least on the labor side of it. You, you are able more likely to turn a profit, okay? Most POS systems, uh, we use Toast, Square, all those things. They, they have the delayed the figure. It's really basic, it's actually really cool. Like you pull it up and it'll give sales and it'll actually give labor costs and you can use clock in. So it's kind of cool, like as a business owner, you're like, okay, that's a super important number, you're gonna want right around 30%. Anything above like 30, 32%, is where your labor is costing too much for the sales coming in. So that's one factor. So they be right around 30%. Anyway. We have another question online. Um, do you have any tips for keeping employees from stealing cash or not inputting complete orders into the POS? Yeah, that's the that's the ongoing thing, right? That's like the problem of the millennium. Um it, it also is like hiring and Creating uh, a good environment, like you're only going to have food margin to scale, right? Uh, it's called leakage, right? Um, it's something that is like as a, from being in the restaurant industry in March years. It's something that's like accepted to, right? What we do, let's say, the bar uh, at Benny's is um, we tell our employees you have to put like set boundaries, right? You have to put everything you want. Every beer you pour, every shot you pour into the computer, right? So that means it's simple. We have cameras, right? The cameras are most of our shots. I'm sitting at home and watch cameras all day. But um, but the cameras are there to let them know. Um, and you know, we said that it's important. We say uh, everything has to be on the computer, every single thing. So if they, if we, if we said, oh, you see them not basically here, talking about it. They continue to do it, we're talking about it, then we can uh, then let them go and we'll continue to do it because it's something that we have in there, right? Especially since we put clear boundaries on it. Um, but we can tell you about that. We know that they're going to go specifically. Um, eat regular food come in because they either get their shot of vodka or they get one drink out of four or three. And so what we do is we get them as well as we have and say, you have, and there's no monetary amount you have. Freedom to do this fill tap and to buy drinks for people, right? Including the ship drink or or not. That's, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, it should be closer. I wouldn't recommend giving their employees out to all the trouble. They perhaps do not at home. Uh, but we give them the freedom to do a fill tap. And I, we have to tell them to do that and like that. And we don't give them monetary rules. I think that's stupid. Uh, because if they're selling the one thousand dollars and they only fit our tag and a kneecaps, right? To sell the one thousand dollars and still tap that means they bought hundred dollars a dollar and reality that's cost me thirty, forty dollars, right? And the sales are massive. I'm okay. So you know when you just talk to your employees, um I found that like don't do a very fist type thing that you know it should be a job. You know, if, if your employee present you, kind of probably still from you, right? Um, all the that in the kitchen and for everyone, um, they're going to be able to the pizza for themselves, right? And then I want to the kitchen will experiment with fan meals. That's a concept often 
Um, I'm going to take their class and offer employees. And if they're with like a girlfriend or a mom or something, I'm going to be extend that 35% to them. We don't get into that. They don't know if they're crap friends. Everybody's 35% not going to do that. So, um, kind of, you know, give them reasons not to stay. Is that it? Ooh. One minute over. <laughs> 